welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Alex and Lena weren't paying attention the other day and I have stolen the keys to History Hack to our podcast recording studio to bring something that I find really interesting uh, into the recording booth. And for that, I've got Peter Johnson, who is a historian from Leicester. He specialises in railway history and has written extensively on the subject with such books as the Festiniog Railway and Welsh Highland Railways. But he's here today to talk to us about his new book, Rail by Mail. So, Peter, uh, welcome to the show. Good morning. Oh, well, thank you. That's pleased to be with you. Yeah, it's good to speak to you. I've, I've had, a, I must admit, I was, I was thinking about this the other day when I was reading your book. Um, I grew up in the countryside in the sort of 80s and 90s when there were, there was not much else to do when you're 10 years old other than to look out the window. And I remember sitting there, I had a flashback of staring out the window watching Royal Mail carriages go past at like eight o'clock at night. And I remember being as a kid finding this really interesting. So when, uh, when this came, the title came up, I was like, yeah, I've totally got to do this one. We'll start at the beginning. The post office was quite innovative in getting post out. And we'll, with the advent of the railway, it provides an amazing opportunity. But how do we get the two services coming together? Well, well there are some parts of the post office that were quite reactionary and they weren't interested in making the change at all. But there's a, a man called Freeling, uh, who was a baronet, and uh, he was very keen in innovation. And he supported the introduction of the Penny Black as well. Um, and he supported the use of railways. And so when the um, uh, Liverpool and Manchester Railway was opened, which was the first intercity railway, um, he sent a man up to uh, Manchester to see what it was all about and to see how they could make use of it. And it all, all grew out from there. Um, when the Liverpool, uh, Birmingham and London Railway opened, um, then the post office was using that right from the first day it opened. And they got a, a through route then from London to uh, Manchester and Liverpool. Um, which is sort of taking six, six hours or so to get the mail from one end to the other, whereas previously it would have taken a day or a day and a half to go by road. Absolutely. The scope for communication is just immense when you're able to cut that kind of time off. But as railway mail, um, sorry, but as railway mania takes hold, how does the rail post distribution system evolve? As the railways opened, then there started to be a demand from the public for the mail service to be transferred to rail as soon as possible. Whereas there was a tendency uh, by some in the post office to want to hold off um, and not to uh, move so quickly. But the public was forcing the demand in the end. Um, and it, was, it became commonplace that uh, a new section of railway was opened and the, uh, the post had transferred to it straight away. So I was, um, I was talking to a friend last night about this uh, we, in the pub. We were saying about um, Beeching's Cuts, which we've done an episode of recently as well. A lot of the smaller villages like Goudhurst and Hawkehurst in Kent, where I grew up, the, um, they had their own branch line. Would the mail have gone up branch lines or was there like a central place where the mail would be pulled together and then distributed later? Well, mostly it would have gone to the, the larger towns and probably some small towns as well. Um, some of the longer branch lines did, did get a, a service, um, but mainly it was, it was for uh, the main lines. I mean, it, the, the Royal Mail was the first big national distribution service. Uh, it was a forerunner of the uh, the trunk service that you see on the motorways today. 
Yeah. Um, and they really had a, an integrated network as, as, as far as they could. Um, there's also this sort of enduring image of the Royal Mail sort of in the 18th century of uh, post carriages thundering up the roads, but often being held up by highwaymen. And was there any such, was there any such, you would have think, think that trains were a bit safer. Was it, were there any incidences of crime uh, on the post trains? There was problems with, with crime. Some of it was opportunistic with people, uh, you know, uh, there'd be a train on the station with the door open and somebody on the platform seeing, seeing something that looked interesting and, and just helping themselves. Others was a bit more organized. There were, there were several cases of employees stealing the registered letters uh, that had got money in them. Then of course, the most famous case was what they call the great train robbery. Um, yeah. And that, that was the culmination of a group of people who had been actually robbing trains for several years, uh, mainly in London and the, in the uh, southeast of the country. But they got together this plan, which uh, I think everybody's heard about, to uh, stop the, the main line, uh, main train from uh, Scotland to London, um, which at the time they were carrying. Um, old banknotes back to the Bank of England uh, for re, uh, to, to be uh, to be scrapped because they were being replaced. Um, so they knew that there's going to be a lot of money on this train. Um, and the, uh, the record is that they um, uh, succeeded in, in getting away with uh, about six million pounds and most wow. of it was never recovered. The, uh, yeah. So that is the most notorious one. Um, and of course, yeah. it, it forced the post office to uh, uh, put more security into the trains because their attitude up to them, well, we've never had any problems. Why do we need to do anything? Well, of course, the train robbery showed them why they should do something. Absolutely. So whenever there's a disaster, there's always after the fact of, oh, yeah, probably we should have been doing this in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there have been minor cases before where the, the, so it was, uh, no uh, notice of it was one of them. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, the other thing when I, I always wanted when I was a kid growing up was a train set, but I could never afford it. But my friend had one and he had the uh, the postal one. Yeah. And uh, it had a, it even had a little model apparatus so that as the Hornby train went by, um, a little so it dropped the little mail bag into the carriage. I remember sitting staring at that for hours. <laughs> it was just a circular track. Yeah, so I've, I've got two. Did have this. Yeah, I've got two or three of those upstairs. The um, but the the Royal Mail British apparatus uh, became quite sophisticated and uh, was designed to put the mail off the trains at places where, if they stopped, it would probably take ten. They'd lose ten to fifteen minutes in the journey by stopping the train to drop the mail off and pick up new mail. By using this apparatus, they can make the trains much faster. And they, um, they had posts uh, by the line side, which they could hang bags of mail on. And they uh, had big uh, sacks, um, troughs of uh, netting, where they could pick up the mail off the trains. And they did spend a lot of time over the years in fine tuning this system. And it lasted until the 1970s. And one of the reasons it came to an end was that the trains were getting faster. This was with the electrification between London and Glasgow. And the trains were getting faster. And to uh, be exchanging the mail at this speed, so it was actually getting quite, uh, quite unsafe. So that they stopped doing it. But you can still go to the Great Central Railway in Leicestershire. And uh, several times a year, they put on demonstrations to see the uh, exchange of uh, uh, mail from the uh, train to the line side and vice versa. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll have to come up and have a look for that. Have a look for that. My, my son would love that. Before the electrification and it got too fast, was it, how, how, how successful was it? Was there, was it, I can hear in the back of my head, health and safety. <laughs> was, it, was, it, was it particularly dangerous before that? Yeah, well, it, I mean, 
uh, an old postman who, who was, uh, well, I'm going to tell you, he, he was an Irishman, so uh, I mean, some Irishmen uh, are known for telling you stories, but uh, he said to me that uh, it, it was all right to, up to about 60 miles an hour, um, but after 60 miles an hour, you, you kept well out of the way of it. Because you get these bags of mail that were coming into the trains were uh, 40 or 50 pounds in weight. So you can imagine uh, getting th thwacked with one of those at uh, 70 mile an hour would be quite painful. Um, oh, God. God, and you'd yes, probably yeah. have to spend a few weeks in hospital because of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to haul mail uh, for the, I worked in the IWM post room a long time ago and some of the sacks of mail that would come in, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't think they reached that weight, but I wouldn't want to be hit by one of those at 60 miles an hour. It's quite yeah, a I mean, the, the things for the, um, the apparatus on, on the trains, I mean, they put several bags of mail inside the big, what they call the pouch which is made of leather. Uh, so you can imagine it was very strong and uh, to, to protect the, uh, the mail. Um, so it's quite a hefty um, uh, item uh, to come uh, flying through the, um, through, the, through the door. And there were cases where the um, mail coming in the opposite direction, this was hung out on the, uh, on, on the line size standard. And there were cases of people put, having their heads out of the window of the train and uh, being injured. Uh, and in one uh, case, uh, a woman was killed uh, when she hit her head on the uh, on the apparatus, on the bag hanging off the apparatus. Uh, mm. So it was quite dangerous. Oh, wow. That made it, made it makes me think back to the uh, Quentin Blake, we had uh, at school, we got the uh, Quentin Blake illustrated railway safety thing uh, book. And there was, uh, don't put your head out of the window of the train and the person's head coming off. But I don't think oh. it, it, it didn't say anything about watch out for flying mail bags. <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly the point. And yeah. of course, there, there are some line side features which are closer to the train than perhaps he, uh, well, they, he wouldn't be allowed nowadays. I mean, it, 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 it would never get through the uh, uh, the safety case uh, Gosh, no. Me no. mechanism, you know, I mean, it was something that uh, is it. In, invented in the um, 1830s and 1840s when they, they didn't assess things in the way that they would do nowadays. And, and just like the train robbery, it's all fine until something goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I mean, it's the old attitude, oh, well, it's never happened before. But it doesn't mean yeah. it's not going to happen. The other thing is, did they have any special specialised rolling stock? And if so, how, how did it change over time as, uh, as the duties changed? Well, they, yes, they did have special carriages. The first ones, which were experimental, were four-wheeled horse boxes, which were converted to uh, give the postman, uh, the post office, the facilities to both uh, stow the mail in bags, but also to sort it in transit. And these became uh, quite sophisticated. I mean, they went up from four wheels to six wheels. And they were making them especially for the post office. Uh, there were quite detailed contracts for this. And then they went on to uh, bogey carriages, like the uh, modern carriages. Yeah. And they, um, they were trains, the uh, up special and the down special, which went from London to um, Aberdeen and back. They were uh, 10 or a dozen carriages full of po postmen sorting uh, mail in transit, so they'll be picking up mail, well, they start from London um, and have mail in London, and they'll be putting it off in, um, on, on, on route. I'm trying to think now where, they, where they'll be doing it. Rugby was one place, and then uh, they go to uh, uh, sort of, there are express trains, and the post office uh, were quite strict about, um, or became quite strict about not having trains with passengers on as well, because if trains had to stop for passengers, then it invariably meant they lost time, um, yeah. which meant their um, their schedule, uh, delivery schedule, went up the went up the swan to to use a phrase. The um, one of the things that the public became very concerned about um, and determined to have very early on in the nineteenth century was that. They liked the idea, so if they were in uh, Edinburgh or Glasgow, they could get a letter delivered 
during the morning, say at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning, and they wanted the facility to be able to reply to that letter and to get it in the post the same day so that it would be delivered back to its sender, uh, in uh, or the original sender in London, say, uh, the following day. Now, this is quite, uh, quite forceful on the part of the public and quite um, imaginative, really, and when you consider this was uh, starting in the 19th century and they've been used to the mail taking sort of several days to, uh, to get through. Um, and then they were saying, well, you can do it the next day. We want it the next day. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite, it, it is quite an, as I said, quite, quite a swap around from, yeah, we can have correspondence over the course of a, about four days or mm -hmm. you can have it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like ordering stuff off, uh, off Amazon. I mean, bef before that, um, you know, you, you'd, uh, you, you'd ring somebody up, you, you'd wait on a, a, a line, you, you, you're, you're, the, you're the tenth in the queue to be answered, you, you'd place your order, and it would arrive the following week. You know, now you can go, on, go online and uh, pre press a button and it turns up the next day. <laughs> Yeah, or if you if you pay for the extras, if you're really lucky, you can get it same day delivery. Which oh, is, I've um, had same day delivery. Yes, yes. Terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I mean um, it's amazing. It's amazing how, how things have changed. Uh, my my daughter was telling me the other when I, uh, we, we were talking about how the way things are now, and I said, you know, just twenty years ago when I was when I was your age, and she said, my word, Dad, you make the nineties sound like the dark ages, and I saw that bad. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm constantly amazed. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit older now, but the, you know, the things that have changed since even, since even I, I was a lad. I mean, my parents, when they first had the telephone, had a shared line, and they had to wait several months before they could even get the shared line. And now, I mean, if you want a telephone, you, you walk into, go into town, you walk into a phone shop and you buy a phone. And you walk out with a working phone. Um, you know, you don't have to wait for somebody to come around and do it. But, you know, no, it's quite amazing the, the contrast in uh, the uh, technology that's available to uh, to people. And the development, the rapid development, that's uh, taken place over the last twenty years. Yeah, it's uh, it's been quite quite amazing. But um, talking of rapid development and stuff. Transporting post across London is it's uh, has its own issues with the roads. I mean, anyone that's drive, driving around London or sitting on a bus going around London, but the but post office come up with a new idea, don't they? They develop a, an underground railway and also the pneumatic tube system. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, even when um, the road traffic was horse drawn, I mean, London was known for its traffic jams, and I think they were doing about six miles an hour, and it's not a lot different now. Um, the, the first thing that happened with regard to the post office was a private company came up with the idea of running a pneumatic uh, tube uh, underground to carry the post and to carry parcels and uh, other goods as well, because this was uh, in sort of electric systems hadn't been fully uh, developed at the time, but uh, they could do pneumatics. And they, they built a rail. Uh, a tube line between Euston in London and the North um, District Post Office, which was about three quarters of a mile away. Um, and that turned out to be quite successful. So they, came, they thought, well, we're, this is working. So we'll go to the, you know, build another tube from Euston and go through the centre of London, go to the um, London Chief Office of the uh, Post Office which is near St Paul's uh, Cathedral. And uh, they started to build this second tunnel, but they had problems financing it. And the post office uh, got uh, fed up with them and said, even if they finished it, they, uh, they wouldn't use it. Uh, so it was eventually abandoned. But as electric systems became more advanced, then the post office came up with its own idea of uh, running an underground railway from Paddington to the uh, Eastern Central District Office, which is just a little bit further east than Liverpool Street in London. And this was a two foot gauge electric railway. It was fully automated, which was the first automated railway in the world. Yeah. Uh, didn't need staff. 
or rather it, it needed uh, stuff to run it, but it didn't need drivers and uh, and guards. So uh, that was a, a benefit, and it meant it wasn't affected by the traffic. The um, and it served all the central London uh, sorting offices. So they started building it in uh, before the First World War, and they built most of the tunnels before the First World War started. And of course, the war came. Uh, some of the tunnels were used for uh, air raid uh, shelters for the public. And then after the war, it took the government a while to raise the money to, uh, to finish the, uh, the project, uh, which meant it, it wasn't finished until uh, 1928. But it was quite successful. And it ran until uh, um, the early, uh, well, about 20, 20 years ago. Part of it is now opened as a uh, mail rail tourist attraction at Mount Pleasant in London, uh, where you can go and actually ride on it. But of course, in the old days, with the, uh, when it was run for carrying mail, then people couldn't ride on it. But, uh, this was quite an, an innovation. Um, there were one or two other places um, overseas. Uh, there's one in uh, Canada, I think, and yeah. uh, one in Germany, where they did a similar thing. Um, but the, um, the post office one, again, it was integrated. It was part of the network. So, uh, but it, this was overtaken by development of email and the number of uh, volume of letters uh, started to fall. And the, um, so there wasn't as much work for the uh, Underground Railway. So uh, it couldn't uh, justify itself. And again, uh, there's probably a bit of investment was needed. Ideally, they could have extended it to uh, the, the new uh, road sorting office at, um, at Willston, but uh, they couldn't justify the expenditure on it, which is from a railway point of view is quite unfortunate. And that there, were, there was a suggestion that uh, they could sell the tunnels and use it for delivering uh, parcels. But of course, the people who wanted parcels delivering uh, didn't want to go where the post office went to, wanted to go. Yeah. So it wasn't very much used to that. So most of it is now mothballed, apart from the short section, that, as I say, at uh, Mount Pleasant, where uh, people, you, people can go and visit it and uh, have a short ride underground, which is quite interesting. I've done that. It's been it's quite pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one of those things I, when I, was working in London that I, was, I kept meaning to go and do a friend of mine went on it and he said it was fantastic but I really must find time to go and do it and um, yeah. got round to us and, and the, other, the other tour that they do they do the little train where, where you can go and ride on the ground but also they r run walking tours so you can actually walk through the tu tunnels and, uh, right. and see it from the ground which of course it takes a, a lot longer than going around on the train so it gives you better um, to more time to understand the uh, the nature of the construction and how, how they built it and uh, what was there and of course the staff who uh, escort you uh, give you uh, stories and tell you uh, about what it, what it was like underground uh, for the uh, postman who worked on it as well. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have to try and make make my way up there at some point. Uh, yeah, uh, I, think I can uh, recommend both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Might drag my son along. He'd be in, he'd be really into that. Moving on, though, we tell us about what the Shrewsbury crash of 1907. Shrewsbury railway approach from Crewe is on quite a sharp curve, and there's a, a speed restriction to approach Shrewsbury station. And in 1907, uh, one night the train was approaching, and for reasons, of course, nobody ever has properly found out why, um, the driver didn't break the train, uh, didn't apply the brakes. Uh, and so the train derailed, and this was one of the mail trains, and there were several postmen who, who were killed. At that time, in 1905 to 1907, there are there three or four or five, I think, um, of these high-speed derailments and the similar circumstances. Uh, Grantham was another one, Salisbury was another one, uh, where whether the driver just lost his concentration Nobody, nobody knows, because obviously the driver and the fireman were killed. Um, yeah. But uh, it's quite uh, a shortening thing. Uh, 
at the time. I mean, there were, there were and of course, there were passengers killed as well. They got passengers on the train. Um, but, uh, there, I mean, there's so few ones in my book because of the uh, the postmen who were killed. Um, but um, the the others were quite significant incidents in, the, in their own right as uh, railway accidents. Yeah, I've, I've got an inclining there was a there was a crash in Marden in Kent, so, and it had something to do with the post train. But I, I, it's a distant memory, and I can't remember the details of it. I might be I think there might have been a passenger train and a freight train. I might be forget. It's been a long time since I read about it. Yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't uh, bring to mind at the, at the moment. No, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, Hinder Green was one that uh, you you might have heard of, uh, but that wasn't a mail train. Uh, that was a passenger train. Uh, yeah. Where where they think that the, uh, the the locomotive in that case overbalanced, uh, and there was a problem with the locos, not just with the the track or the driving. Yeah, the the other one that bounces to mind was uh, Charles. Again, it was passenger trains. I know it's off topic, but there was the uh, one outside Staplehurst, which Charles Dickens was on. Um, yeah. the engine ended up in the River Bule. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's affected him as well. He wrote about it, um, having been on this accident. I mean, he was very lucky uh, uh, not to have been seriously injured. Yeah, it could, it could have been a lot. From memory, that was that someone was doing rail works, but no one had told the trip, told the drivers, and mm. uh, again. Distant memory. I need to read up on them again. But um, but how did how did nationalisation of British Rail affect the mail service though? Because before you had all the individual companies like the um, Chatham and Dover lines and stuff. Uh, how when it all becomes British Rail, how did how did that affect them? Well, with British Rail, there was obviously just one uh, one company providing the service to the post office. What it did mean was the um, uh, the carriages which had been introduced by the um, um, pre the predecessors, the Great Western, the Southern, the LNER, um, and the Great um, LMS. Um, some of those were quite uh, quite modern, uh, but others were quite old. So they started to be replaced. And uh, British Rail introduced a standard design. Um, which could go anywhere in the country. Some of, because some of the older ones were, uh, could only go on particular routes, um, which obviously uh, limited their uh, their use, because they've been commissioned by the post office to work on work on particular routes. So uh, with British Rail, and they um, obviously used more modern techniques as well. They started in the 1950s and carried on to the 1970s. Uh, building new uh, new post office carriages. Yeah, and um, did the I, I know I've mentioned them before, but did the Beechings cuts have that much of a, an effect on the service as well? Well, it uh, affected some of the routes that were available. The um, but I mean the um, the main lines obviously continued, and they weren't affected by by Beeching at all. Um, it was the feeding routes that were affected, um, but the um, so there was there still a viable network with the post office. Um, it did shrink, shrink over the years, and they used to uh, review the service and, and make changes to it uh, probably every three or four years or so, um, depending on the uh, on the changes. They introduced um, a measure of uh, using uh, airmail on some services because, uh, you know, the East Midlands Airport, not far from me, um, at uh, Castle Donington, was a place where um, the mail would come by train to Derby and be taken by uh, road from Derby to um, East Midlands Airport, and then put on an aeroplane and flown to uh, Newcastle or to uh, to Scotland uh, because they could do it much faster doing it that way. Uh, so uh, they were still looking at uh, innovation. Uh, all, all the way through the history of this uh, this service. Yeah, um, the sad thing is though that by two thousand and four, that the service is is sort of being is finally withdrawn. Well, I know we touched on it already, but was it sort of what were the sort of causes for this? Was it just like the advent of email? Sort of, um... well, yeah, yes. I mean, a number of number of things. The um, advent of email, as, as you say. Um, Reduce the volume of uh, letters being carried. Um, 
The, um, uh, another issue which wasn't touched on when, uh, in 2004 was actually the carriages were getting worn out and needed to be replaced. And they weren't, some people at the Royal Mail weren't sure that they'd be able to make a safety case for running carriages like that, um, how they could uh, demonstrate that they were safe um, for people to be standing up whilst the trains traveling at uh, speeds of up to uh, say 80 or 90 miles an hour. Um, they didn't really think they could do it. And then it came to the, the question of investment and whether they could justify the investment. So um, there are other issues going on as well. The um, company that provided the uh, haulage service for the Royal Mail had the impression that Royal Mail would pay anything for the service um, and kept putting up its prices apparently, uh, whereas Royal Mail were actually uh, quite price sensitive uh, because it was in the competitive market that all the people wanted to, uh, to enter. Um, and so uh, it would have been difficult for them to have carried on anyway because the, carriage, because the carriages were wearing out and, and probably couldn't be replaced. Um, but there was a uh, dispute over the cost of the service as well. And the fact that the uh, road network had become stable um, and the, uh, the technique of putting distribution centers next to motorway junctions and um, being uh, very, very convenient and reliable. Um, obviously um, took over as, as, the, um, as the, the book mail carriage option of choice, you might say. Absolutely. Although uh, I'm going to get in a private whinge at the moment. This is only really applicable to me. My mother posted my birthday, it was my birthday on Friday. Mm. Um, my mother posted a card from uh, Newark in Nottinghamshire on Sunday, second class. We're now a week on, still no birthday card, so Royal Mail. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you, you can tell stories like that, and obviously with justification. But equally, I've had stuff sent to me one day, and it's arrived the next day. And, um, yeah, likewise. Um, I, I, I posted my nephew's card. He lives in Newark as well, and uh, it, it arrived literally the next day. So I, <laughs> I'm just a bit Thank bitter. You. My me up and ask if my cards arrived. <laughs> I think it depends on the part of the country you are, I think, uh, just why the route is and on the nature of the stuff in the locality. Uh, yeah. it's, it's like when you talk about your, um, your delivery, um, your, your internet delivery uh, van service, uh, and some people will call uh, one company or another, and I'm not going to name any now, um, but it actually depends on the on the man or woman on the day, um, and some of them are extremely reliable and trustworthy, and others are not reliable. Um, uh, absolutely, like my fish tank that I ordered that was pitched over the garden fence. <laughs> I came home to a box of broken glass, yeah. and then yeah, like you said others are others are really good. So yeah, it's uh, one of those things. Yeah, it, it, it varies according to the people who are doing it. So uh, you can't point the finger at one or the other, I don't think. Um, yeah, Peter, this has been fantastic. It's been really interesting. Would you mind uh, just reminding us the title of your book and uh, where people can get it from? Okay, well, the book is uh, Mail by Rail. The, um, the story of the post office and the railways. You can get it from well-known internet suppliers. Uh, you can get it from bookshops. Some bookshops will have it in stock. Uh, some will get it to you for order, uh, to order. And the, um, but it's, uh, and the publisher, is, we should say the publisher, I think, and that's Pen and Sword. Um, yeah. And they've got a website and you can buy it from them as well. So uh, there's lots of uh, choice for buying it and different prices. Uh, I shouldn't tell you that. I shouldn't tell you the full price because I get most money out of that. But um, you can get it at different prices as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And I will speak to the powers that be. Uh, we have our own history hack bookshop, online bookshop. Oh. I will speak to the powers that be if we can get it in. Then that way you get more money. We get some more money. It goes into an independent booksellers and Jeff Bezos can't use it for uh, spaceship money. Which is yeah, well, that's, that's how, it, how it should work, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, um, yeah, I mean that's a brilliant idea. 
if you if you've got a shop, you you should stock it. It, it is selling well. Um, I went to a model row exhibition at the uh, NEC on Saturday, uh, and my publisher had got a, a stall, and uh, he sold six copies on Saturday. Uh, wow! And he, uh, which is quite uh, quite good. Uh, so I think he was going to disappoint people on uh, on, on Sunday, on the second day of the exhibition. But uh, but uh, yeah, I think people are uh, you know people are buying it. Um, so uh, hopefully some listeners will go up and buy it as well. Uh, Absolutely. At least and, uh, you know, re find out about it and uh, see what it's about. And uh, there's people are, so far. There's some. I'll tell you what. There's some very good reviews about it. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you know, people who have read it, uh, I've enjoyed it. So. Uh, uh, and, I, and I count myself as one of them. I read it for the for the prep for this episode, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm I'm giving it my seal, seal of approval for for the what that, what that's worth to our listeners. So definitely go out and get get this book. It's uh, oh, definitely worth you. the read. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's been good. It's been a bit fun to chat about it as well. Absolutely, and thanks for coming on. Our incredible guests give us forty five minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result. We have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.